Good afternoon uh, and welcome to this meeting of the Cooperative Executive. Uh, the first item of business today is to elect a chair for the meeting. Do I have any nominations? Can I nominate Councillor Jean Dunn to chair today's meeting? Thank you. Second. Thank you. Are there any other nominations? Okay, no. Can we take a vote then? Um, all those in favour of Councillor Dunn chairing the meeting? Uh, that's carried. Thank you. Over to you, Councillor Dunn. Thank you. Sorry about that, but thank you for your support, colleagues. Okay, welcome, and thank you for attending, and welcome to the meeting of the Cooperative Executive. The meeting today is open to the public, although is a, there is a reduced room capacity to ensure a COVID-secure environment, and that proper social distancing is properly observed. The meeting will be webcast live, and the recording will be available for people to view later through the Council website. As a result of the reduced room capacity, we have two members of the public who are asking questions and report authors who are presenting items today that are observing the meeting on a screen from the reception room. They will be invited into the chamber for their individual items. This may mean there is a short pause between these items to allow them to make their way into the room. I therefore ask you for your patience to allow this to be managed safely. Please can I request that mobile phones and other such equipment are switched to silent mode, so not to disturb the conduct of the meeting. There is no fire test planned for today, and there is an emergency evacuation. If there is an emergency evacuation, please take the instruction from the town hall staff. The assembly point is Tudor Square. And if I can now ask each cooperative member to introduce themselves, starting with Kate. Good afternoon, um, Councillor Kate MacDonald, uh, Councillor for Glidlitz Valley, and I'm the uh, uh, lead member for Finance and Resources. Thank you, Chair. I'm Councillor Jordan Ross Hammond. I'm the Executive Member for Health and Social Care. Paul? Councillor Paul Wood, the lead member for Highways, Waste and Housing. Paul, number two. <laughs> Thanks, Chair. I'm uh, Councillor Paul Turpin, Executive Member for Inclusive Economy, Jobs and Skills. Douglas? Um, Councillor Douglas Johnson, uh, representing City Ward and Executive Member for Climate Change, Environment and Transport. Alison? Councillor Alison Teal, Executive Member for Sustainable Neighbourhoods, Wellbeing, Parks and Leisure. And I'm Councillor Jane Dern. I'm the Executive Member for Education, Children and Families, and I'm um, today's chair. Apologies for absence. Uh, thank you, Chair. I've got apologies from Councillor Terry Fox, Councillor Julie Grocutt, and uh, Kate Joseph, the Chief Exec, and also from Councillor Mazza Iqbal. Item three, any exclusion of the press and public? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, at item 15 on the agenda, there's an appendix which is not available to the public or press because it contains exempt information. If members wish to discuss the information in the appendix, uh, we will ask the members of the public and press to kindly leave for that part of the meeting. We'll halt the webcast at that point. Thank you. Item four, declarations of interest. Are any members wish to declare an interest on any of the items of business on today's agenda? Can you please indicate? Okay, that's fine. Thank you very much. Item five, minutes of the previous meeting. Okay, page nine. Page ten. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 
16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21 and 22. Quite a long time ago, wasn't it? So uh, if we can take those as an accurate record. Okay, thank you. Before we move on to item seven, I would like on behalf of the corporate executive and members of the council to offer my sincere condolences. Um, we've had some rather tragic events since August and I would like to put on note the death of Mohammed Majidi on August the 18th, the murder on Friday of Mohammed Issa Karoma, and on Sunday, the tragic deaths of Terry Harris, John Paul, Lacey, and Connie Gent. I would just like to offer our sincere condolences to the family and friends, and I know I speak on behalf of everybody and the city, but um, our thoughts are with them. Thank you. Right, item seven, items called into scrutiny. I have no items that have been called in. Item eight is the, sorry, Oh, sorry, sorry, my fault, I've missed item six. I do apologise, everybody. This is quite new to me. Item six, public questions and petitions. We have two questions, and we have a Mr Adam Butcher. We'll just wait for him to come through. Thank you. Before I ask, uh, Mr. Butcher hasn't arrived, so he will be getting his answer in writing. And we now have Mr. Slack. Welcome, Mr. Slack. I wouldn't have felt like I was chairing a meeting if you hadn't have turned up, so you've made my day. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. I'll hand it over to you. If you'd it's like to ask your question, please. It's good to see you in an elevated position again. <laughs> um, one question today, um, and it's entitled Mount Pleasant, <coughs> because it was interesting to see the name Mount Pleasant featuring on today's agenda. I fondly hoped that there would be some positive news about the purchase of Mount Pleasant House in Sharrow. Sadly not. This was concerning a compulsory purchase order in Chapel Town. Interestingly, the Mount Pleasant in Sharrow has been empty longer than the one in Chapel Town, and yet we see no apparent progress. What is the current state of repair of Mount Pleasant House in Sharrow? I note that there are windows still boarded up there after three years. When does Sheffield City Council expect to sign contracts on the sale, if at all? And is it time that the council admitted the failure of this sale and returned to the discussions with the community, ent community enterprise known as Avenues to Zero to finally save this listed building from dereliction? I fondly think that if that had been the decision in the first case, it would actually now be up and running and supporting the neighbourhood of Sharrow in recovering from uh, COVID and Brexit and everything else this government thrown at it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Slack. I shall ask uh, Councillor Macdonald to respond to your question. Councillor Macdonald. Thank you, Chair. And uh, thank you for the question, um, Mr Slack. 
Um, I think I'm going to make you day, <laughs> or maybe not. Um, but just to let you know that um, contracts were signed um, on, about, for the property, sale of the property in June, and the property has transferred to the new owners. Uh, the new owner has developed plans for the repair of the listed structure and work should commence in the very near future with the property due to reopen once repairs are complete next year. So I hope you're um, pleased with that response, Mr Slack. Obviously, there have been delays with COVID and stuff like that as well. But um, the sale has now been completed and the work is due to start in the near future. So thank you for your question again. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor MacDonald. It's quite a palaver, isn't it? <laughs> Lovely to see you. Take care of yourself. I'll get the agenda in the right order now. So we're now on item seven, which is items called into the scrutiny. We don't have any items called in, is that correct? Thank you. And we'll move on to item eight, which is the food poverty scrutiny report and recommendations. This came to full council and uh, we approved the new food ladder and everything else, but we're gonna be able to discuss this really, really important issue. So we'll just wait for Emily Stanbrookshaw to arrive. Welcome, Emily. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Are you um, ready? Yeah. Whenever you're ready. Great. Right, thank you. Okay. So um, I'm here on behalf of the Overview and Scrutiny Management Committee. Um, last municipal year, they set up um, a working group, cross-party working group, chaired by Councillor McDonald, um, to look at food poverty in Sheffield. Um, it was intended that the group would take a phased approach, recognising the time limits we had and the, and the kind of the scale of the issue. Um, and this first phase was looking at the strategic role of the council in relation to food poverty and its relation to food projects working in the city. Um, the working group heard evidence from a wide range of people and organisations, um, council officers working in food and poverty, frontline officers working in communities, um, BCF organisations who were providing advice and food support, um, academics working on food security. Um, we also ran a public call for evidence which invited people to share their experiences of food poverty, whatever they may be, with the group. Um, from those discussions, um, some consistent issues and themes emerged which um, have informed the recommendations in the working group's report, which you've got as Appendix 1 in your papers. Um, the group's recommendations were set out around four themes, strategy and culture, developing a comprehensive network of food support, navigating the system and leadership. Um, at the time of writing the report, it was intended that um, we'd bring it as an interim report to Cabinet in April. Unfortunately, um, that meeting didn't take place. Um, and then, obviously, the world changed quite dramatically in terms of our governance structures. Um, scrutiny no longer has that policy development role, so the intention that future phases of this work would happen through scrutiny um, that's, that won't happen now, um, but members still wanted to bring this report to you to kind of um, conclude this first phase. Um, so it's here for you today, and the Overview and Scrutiny Management Committee is asking you to um, consider its report and recommendations and come back to the committee with a response um, at the appropriate time. So I'm happy to take any questions, or I'm sure Councillor MacDonald might want to uh, add to that. <laughs> I was going to bring Councillor MacDonald in. I'll say thank you for the report, Emily. Absolutely so thorough and it's never been more relevant than it is right now. And I know that Councillor Fox has written to government. 
about the right to food and have it written into national legislation. But I'll hand over to Council MacDonald to talk about this great piece of work that uh, he did, which feels like many moons ago. <laughs> Uh, before I, I, I start, I'd just like to acknowledge as well that uh, Councillor uh, Douglas, Douglas Johnson was, in, was involved in the, the work as well. So it was a cross-party piece of work, and I think everybody who was involved in it found it very challenging and, and a really useful piece of work. And um, I'd first of all, just like to thank all members of the group because it was a very intensive piece of work over a very short period of time, and, and we put a lot of work into it. Um, I also think I'd like to thank Emily as well because she did a fantastic job in, in organising it for, for us as well. And also to thank the people who contributed to the, the work. Um, we, they're all listed in the report them itself. So it was a very, um, uh, it was, was co-produced really and also with officers because everybody recognised it was a piece of work that needed doing. I'd like to commend the recommendations uh, to the executive some of it's already been picked up in uh, uh, a motion that went through council la last month. And I understand as well that in the forthcoming um, uh, summit on, on poverty that some of this can actually be picked up. But I, I think it's a really good thing that we are, we are actually, in a way, getting a bit of closure to it because it wasn't a bit of, 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 of limbo until um, it came to the executive so that it does actually become a sort of formal document uh, for, the, for, for the council. There's a lot more work needed. Um, I think we just started to, um, uh, to identify some of the problems um, and, and things aren't going to get any better for people for the time being either with, with, with all of the um, uh, adverse events that are going to be taking place um, uh, under this government. So I'd just like to um, commend it to the executive um, and thank everybody that was involved and, and also to endorse the recommendations. I hope, hope you'll allow me to do that, although it's sort of slightly a, a, a conflict of interest. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Johnson, do you have anything to add? Since yes, thank you. Yeah, um, just, um, I suppose, to echo what Councillor McDonald said about thanking the people involved with it. Um, including you, Emily, for bringing this together. I mean, it, it was you know, a, a fairly short and fairly intensive piece of work, as you said, um, certainly by council standards, uh, to bring this together and crash out a few issues there. I think we also recognise there's quite a lot of other things that are hanging in there. And this is, as you'll see, it's labelled as an interim report with the expectation that there is clearly more to do. Probably there is a question now about um, what is, how that is taken forward. Um, so whether it's just bounced back to OSMC to continue, or rather now one of the new transition committees, or instead, now that it is in the executive's um, court, um, it's a question of how we respond to it now. And I think one of the recommendations is about the uh, lack of leadership of any particular portfolio in, in the Council on Food Poverty. Uh, and of course, if you look at um, page 23 on the very front page, it says, which cooperative executive member does this relate to? And it says all, and by all, of course, it means none. Um, actually, none of us is taking particular responsibility for being the executive member to uh, respond to this. So that possibly is something that we should um, try and resolve. I don't know whether we want to do that today, whether we've got any offers to take that forward, um, or, or what. But I think the, the, we do need to have something to address, actually, who is responsible for just moving this project on. Uh, so it's also in context of the, you know, the financial cliff edge is often talked about. You know, we, we're all very concerned about things like the you know, imminent cut in um, universal credit and um, uh, many other changes that could push people, if we're unlucky, towards the need for food banks when, you know, certainly from my point of view, that's the thing we need to eliminate. We need to get people in stable financial situations. So just my comment on that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. In the recommendations, um, I slightly disagree with you by all. That doesn't mean it's not been taken, because I know that in my portfolio, children and families, it's been a major part of it. And as I said before, we have Councillor Fox has actually taken leadership on this by writing to government. And we have actually set up here, if we look at the recommendations on page 37, three 2.5 where Sheffield has actually begun doing that with the food ladder we're putting together all our voluntary organizations mapping it so we have a really cohesive view this is actually built on all the work that Sheffield's done through the pandemic 
and how we've got that. So yes, while I agree it doesn't have its own portfolio, but we are in a very, very, we're in a transitional period, I think you, uh, Councillor Fox will be making sure that, as I will and I think every single one of us in our portfolio will be able to do that. So I think this is a real cross portfolio, cross party, because, you know, access to food, it affects every single area of our council. And as you quite rightly said, with the um, uplifted possibility of um, universal credit, we've got the rising gas prices, do you know, never has making sure that our children, families and every person of has a decent meal be more important. I'm so sorry, Councillor Turpin, I didn't see you indicate. I haven't got the right glasses with me. <laughs> thanks very much. Um, yeah, I, I also want to say thanks for bringing the report and it's really thorough and, uh, and there's some good recommendations and I, I just wanted to say that you know, it's just so, so sad that we need to consider this in 2021 in one of the richest nations in the world and and i'm um, and i'm glad that it's been acknowledged that really the, the, the use of food banks and such it's a sticking plaster on on the uh, underlying causes of uh, which is inequality and unemployment poverty and um so thanks for putting it all together and, and also i'm really uh kind of a spinning off from what Councillor Johnson was saying is how this take, is taken forward and, uh, the, and the, towards the end section 3.5 areas for future consideration really acknowledging that this is an interim report and it's not the, the end of the, of the work and the work regarding things like cash versus vouchers which I think really empowers people and, and, and destigmatizes um, food poverty and then food supply and food growing, which is going to be really important and, and will actually has the potential to create a lot of jobs, which in turn could also alleviate food poverty in itself and uh, secure Sheffield's um, food for the future. So, yeah, looking forward to, to the next step as well. And thanks very much. Thank you. I think I saw Councillor Teal. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Dunn. Um, yeah, thank you very much, Emily, for bringing the report, and uh, thanks to everyone who's done all the work on this already. Um, I just wanted to say that I think that Sheffield is really well placed to be doing some really good work on this. We've got excellent um, things happening. We've got an Institute of Sustainable Food at the university. We've got the Chef Food Partnership that's growing in strength, and um, I'm looking into what we can do to work with Chef Food as a partnership there. And I'm um, also personally involved in uh, creating food growing projects that I'm hoping to see expand significantly um, over time and have more of the council's involvement in that. I think there's potential to create a lot of jobs as well as a lot of really good nutritious, nutritious food. And um, yeah, I'm really excited that we're taking this uh, so seriously. I think that we can do some really good work here. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Councillor MacDonald. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to come back on, on, on what you were saying. Um, it was really about, uh, we do have a, a forthcoming um, summit on poverty. So perhaps we could actually say uh, that this actually should feature within that in terms of the leadership role and how it's going to go forward as well. Uh, in fact, we had quite a lot of debate, didn't we, Councillor Johnson, about um, whether or not we should be addressing poverty or whether we should be addressing food poverty. So certainly we need to make sure that the two um, link together, although food poverty is obviously one of the consequences of, of, of poverty for, for, for many people. Um, so, my, so my suggestion, having listened to what colleagues have said, is that we, we do um, propose that, that uh, the issue of food poverty um, is raised at the summit uh, that's going to take place on poverty in its wider sense as well in October. And that's an opportunity for, um, therefore, deciding how and by whom uh, this type of work would be um, taken forward. Thank you. Uh, do I have a, a seconder for that proposal? Thank you, Councillor Teal. I saw Councillor Teal first. Yeah, that's my. <laughs> yeah. No, we're fighting over it today, aren't we? No, I think that's a really good recommendation because I think we used to talk about heating or eating, didn't we? And now we've got that with 
you know, we've got it with dates and we've got it with everything. So I think it's all encompassing. And we saw that with the free school meals, which, you know, as well, which is in my own portfolio, which we lobbied the officers, as we commented at the last uh, cabinet, is how they have to actually fight really hard to get the vouchers. So we really do need to keep this on the agenda, but we can bring it up in our local area committees and in all our portfolios, and as Councillor McDonald said, at the Poverty Summit. So thank you, and thank you for the report. Thank you, Emily. Okay, so I just need to read out the recommendations. So the recommendations are that Sheffield City Council should implement the Tackling Poverty Framework Oh, page 20. Oh, I do apologise, everybody. They're going to never ask me to do this again, aren't they? <laughs> okay, the recommendations are that the executive is asked to thank the Overview and Scrutiny Management Committee for its work in relation to food poverty in Sheffield. Consider and note the Scrutiny Food Poverty Working Group report that is attached as the Appendix 1 to the report and agree that a cooperative executive response to the recommendations in the report be provided to a future meeting of the Overview and Scrutiny Management Committee. And on top of that, we're going to recommend it to the summit as well. Thank you. Sorry, just to clarify, I just wanted to know who's taking that piece of work forward? I agree with the recommendation, but who's actually going to be doing it? Well, it says in here, the over, well, 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 we'll put that forward to Councillor Fox, because we'll put that forward to Councillor Fox, because I know that he's been, as I said at the beginning, he has been leading in fighting that with government, so that we'll put that forward to Councillor Fox. It's not going to be forgotten, Councillor Johnson, I can assure you, especially since I seem to have spent most of my time actually uh, dealing with this since I came into post as the executive member, but don't worry. Thank you. That, that's fine. I, I wonder if that could be recorded as part of a recommendation then, but um, just so that everyone's clear that it is Councillor Fox whose um, name will be on the, um, on for food poverty. I mean, it's one of the specific recommendations it's paragraph 3.4.3. Yeah, so, thank you, that, Councillor McDonald. So, so that was the point of my suggestion that it's discussed as part of the, um, the, the poverty summit. Um, so that, that, that was the point of my, so that rather than it was just in the long grass, that um, as part of the poverty summit, the leadership around this could, could, could actually be discussed and how the council is going to take it forward. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, Emily, you can up and down like a yo yo. <laughs> Sorry, Councillor Teal. Um, yeah, um, I'm not sure when the poverty summit is it already, is the date set? And, and are we all attending? Councillor Teal, we'll get those details sent out to you. Okay? Okay. I, I just you. think it's in my diary. Yeah, I think Thank we can you. discuss that outside the cabinet, you know, the corporate executive meeting, yeah. Okay. Item nine. Staff retirements. Okay. I think we should note, as it was pointed out by an officer, but I'd actually done the maths. I'm not very good at maths usually, but I've definitely done the maths. It was over 338 years, was it 300 and 388 years collectively. That's quite a number, isn't it? And I'd really like to take on note and thank them for all their service. Um, they really are the backbone of the council. And 388, wow, but yeah. But thank you, thank you so much. N is the extension to the home care and support of living framework. This is going to be uh, presented by Joe Horobin. And we're just going to wait for Joe to come into the room.
Thank you. Welcome, Joe. And uh, would you like to introduce yourself? And I'm sorry, I haven't got the other lady's name. <laughs> Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, can you hear me? Yeah. My name's Robin Pryor. I'm the author of the report. Welcome, Robin. Hi, I'm Jo Horobin. I'm Head of uh, Commissioning for Adult Social Care, and Robin is uh, a member of my team. And this is the first uh, report she's written for Cooperative Exec, so she's come along to see how this process works firsthand. Thank you. So... I'll give you a quick, uh, I've got two agenda items in a row. Um, this one, just to remind everybody, is the home support um, contract extension request. Um, home support covers um, two, uh, two types of care and support. It's a framework that covers uh, supported living, which is largely uh, used uh, by people with a disability to enable them to live independently in their own tenancies or in their own homes and home care, or domiciliary care as it's sometimes referred to, which uh, enables people to, again, to, uh, to stay in their own homes uh, with uh, support, with personal care uh, and other, other activities uh, of, of day to day life. Um, we are requesting an extension to the current framework of 18 months um, and the, um, that will take us through to April 2023. Um, home care in particular has had a really, um, really challenging five years and has proved itself to be incredibly resilient um, through the pandemic, through extremely difficult times. We've actually seen a 100% increase pretty much in the last five years in the number of uh, hours that we procure. So we now, we now deliver at through the independent sector home care market, we deliver 42,000 hours, although it varies week by week, um, but around 42,000 hours. That's 2.1 million visits per year to vulnerable people in the city. And it's just less than 3,000 people at any time who are receiving that support. So this is a really fundamental part of um, the, the way in which we deliver our duty under the Care Act. Uh, we have huge changes that we want to make, that said. Uh, we want to um, develop the home care model to be more person-centred, more flexible, more community-based, uh, and to support people to have a more outcomes-focused um, care plan. Uh, in order to do that, we have a huge amount of work to do. This is like... Um, this is uh, a huge undertaking with this many hours being procured uh, and hence us coming with the request for the extension to allow us more time to work with the market as it responds still ongoing to the pressures of the pandemic and to work with people who use services or who may wish to use services in the future or need to use services in the future uh, to ensure that, they, that the model that we eventually go to procure to have in place in April 2023 is um, the optimum for the city and really delivers real benefits for people in the city. Um, supported living, similarly, we have plans to develop that even further. That remains very stable in terms of numbers um, and has also been incredibly resilient through the pandemic. Um, we have plans to increase the choice and control uh, that people with supported living are able to exercise over the way that, that that support is provided and the way that the budget associated with that support is spent to best meet their needs. So in light of the huge amount of work that we want to do, uh, continue doing, and the impact of this for the city and the pressure on the market currently um, as it continues to respond to the pandemic, we're requesting that 18-month extension. Thank you. Thank you, Joe, and welcome, Robin, and thank you for your report. It's really good. Um, Councillor Linda Salmond. Thank you, Chair. Um, good to see you again, Joe, and to see that, that uh, you're much more mobile at this Cooperative Act meeting, which I'm sure we're all pleased to see. And really good to meet you, Robin. Um, I'm sure it's the first of many excellent reports um, from yourself. I think, um, as you've outlined, this report is actually 
you know, interesting for everyone in the public to read in terms of, you know, just how stark the numbers are in terms of the intensity of home care in particular. Um, I think few people um, in the city perhaps realise the number of hours um, that we commit, that we, that, that we commission and, uh, and, and have delivered by um, those on our framework here. Um, and therefore it's incumbent on us um, to make sure that we are um, commissioning that and delivering that because we shouldn't forget that outside of this paper today, we also deliver um, you know, um, support, particularly in Reable and as a council, and we should be really proud of that work, that the work we do ourselves as well. Um, and it's really important that starting from now, and I know the work has already started, um, that we work as hard as possible to find the best long-term way that we can deliver home care, because I think as we're realizing the council um, and many other councils across the country are realizing that um, the world has changed, not only for our budgets, which are incredibly stretched, um, um, as is noted in this meeting today, but in terms of um, the kind of support people need and the numbers of people um, that are having to be discharged from hospital. You speak to our um, colleagues um, in the hospital trust and they'll tell you that it shouldn't be like this at this time of the year. Um, they should, you know, the sort of summer they've had, they shouldn't have like this. And actually, people very, very often don't just walk out of hospital. They come out and they need support from these services. So the, so the position we are in, I think in terms, of, in terms of home care, is unprecedented. This service has grown up over the years. We need to spend um, you know, the next year to 18 months on, on, on make sure as a council, we get this absolute right for the future. And I'm really pleased that this is stage one today. And just, I think it's worth noting that um, what I've asked and um, I've agreed with the chair of the transitional committee in this area that, um, uh, it's going to be really one of the first things that the transitional committee, and I really hope continuing also um, com the new committee structure, is going to take a special focus on. Because what I know is that there are a lot of a lot of people in this council with some great ideas about how we need to um, change the way we do care. So it's best for the people of Sheffield and best for the council. Um, and I think that that increased focus, um, alongside the really really hard work of, of your of your team. Um, is really going to set us on to a future where we have care which allows us more independent and, and, and live with dignity in the city. So, thanks again. Thank you, George. Uh, anybody else wish to make any councillor Wood? Uh, thank you, Joe, and thank you for the report, Robin. I noticed on the proposal of 1.4. We've been asked to extend this contract for 18 months, but the wording in 1.4 doesn't relate to that. It says a minimum of 18 months extension, which means it could be extended beyond that period indefinitely. Thank you. I would propose that, that this is the word minimum is removed and it becomes an 18 month extension and you have to come back to Chair. cooperative executive if we wishes to go any longer if i could help on this point chair i think the wording is simply meant to explain that um 18 months is the minimum that we require um to do this process and that's therefore the time we're picking um we could have got two or three years but obviously we want to get this done as quickly as possible and 18 months is the minimum time scale, which I think uh, we feel is possible here. Is that often enough to agree with that? Um, Councillor Wood, is that okay? Do you, well, is that clarified I'm now? not happy with the word minimum in because it leaves it indefinitely going onward. Councillor Wood, it does actually say the recommendation on page now you've got me. Page 46, it does actually say minimum. It does say 18. It just says 18 months. Approve the proposed 18 month extension on page 46 in the recommendations. Yeah. 
Well, that, that makes the point. We, we shouldn't have the word minimum in the 1.4 recommendation proposal. Because the contradictory statements. If if Councillor Wood would, if yeah. Councillor Wood feel more, I I I have no objection with removing the word minimum. I don't think in terms of, I don't think it has any effect to the proposal today. Or um, so I'd be happy to rem remove the word minimum if that would make um, more comfortable. But I'm happy to take advice on that. I'm just going to take some advice from Gillian Dufford. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, the, the word minimum is used in the officer report, so it's, it's not something that you, as a committee, can remove from this. It's, you can change the recommendations, but the actual recommendation doesn't use the word minimum. So I think what you are asking for is achieved. So in the minutes, all it will refer to is the 18-month extension. So there shouldn't be any ambiguity on that. That's fine. Thank you. I think I saw Councillor Johnson indicate. Thank, thank you. Yeah, I was just going to. Yeah, I read this as meaning that to the contracts to be extended up until um, the 10th of April or the, the midnight the day before, so it's continuity. I just wondered if you could clarify that. And you're nodding, so I'll say it now if it's read. Just the other question is about consultation. I know it says there's no formal consultation. I'm assuming that the extension is just preserving the status quo, and actually that's in the interest of both the uh, care home businesses and the residents who are getting um, care. Um, but I just want to check, I mean, I presume there has been informal conversations with those people who are going to be affected. Is there anything you can say on that? I'm assuming that there's no kickback from businesses who just get an extension, but useful just to let us know. Thank you. Jo, could you respond? Yes, of course. Um, yes, the, um, there's no requirement for us to consult in detail on the extension. However, we, um, we take um, the quality and the feedback of, uh, on quality from people who use our services that we commission very seriously. So, and we work with um, others in the city, such as Health Watch, um, to help us keep that watching brief, really, um, in terms of the quality for um, care in the city. And yes, we're confident um, that we have, um, that this is the appropriate route to take really for minimising any disruption to people without full and proper engagement in any changes that we do want to make further down the track. So yes, we're absolutely committed to working with uh, people who use services over the next year and a half so that you know, when we go out to procure for something that looks, you know, um, looks looks slightly different on the tin, um, and hopefully is a, a better experience. Uh, that actually people feel that that's that's something that they they are bought into and will will be the best for them. Yeah, thanks. That, that's great. I was just looking at this decision just to extend. I just want to check that the, the care businesses providing the service actually know this is going to happen, and it's not just that they'll only find out when they read about it and start reporting on this tomorrow or something. I'm sure you've got them in hand and it sounds good. Yes, I can confirm that we have um, written to them to say that without prejudice and subject to the agreement of um, the cooperative exec that our intention is to, to extend uh, the contract and the feedback we have had has been, has been positive from providers. Yeah, so I don't anticipate any difficulties. Thank you. Excellent. I just want to give you credit for the consultation that you actually have done, even though you haven't claimed it. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you very much. Uh, if there's no more question, oh, Councillor MacDonald? Uh, it's not a question, but it's a comment. Uh, just to note that I understand the reasons for this extension, but it's actually quite a significant extension. Um, and does require us actually, it has got legal and, and financial implications. And, and it's obvious, I understand exactly why, why you need the, the um, um, extension, but I think it's really clear that, that this is it, and whatever, you know, by the end of the 18 months, uh, we need to have new arrangements in place. And I think that's possibly as well what, what um, uh, Councillor Wood was, was getting at as well, that, that this isn't a, a decision we take lightly. And at the end of this process, we expect to have a, a, a new framework and arrangement in place. I just wanted to clarify that because I know that's what, what presumably you're, you're planning to do anyhow. But 
Thank you for the report, both of you. Right. No more questions, no more comments. Thank you, thank you. We'll go to the recommendations, which are on page 46. It's recommended that the executive approves the proposed 18-month extension to the current home care and supported living framework as outlined in this report. Approved contract extensions being issued to all current framework providers on the home care and supported living framework for the 18-month extension. Okay, take that. Thank you very much. Thank you, that's approved. We'll move on to item 11. Thank you, Robin, and thank you for coming today. My uh, other colleague, Sarah Swinburne, is just swapping, <laughs> swapping in. I've got so used to chairing meetings on Zoom and Teams, it's really strange to have real people around and having to look in, not everybody in front of a screen. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome. Welcome, Sarah. So, item 11, extension to the extra care, housing care and support contracts. And it's over to you again, Jo. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this is um, another request for an extension, um, uh, this time in relation to the extra care uh, uh, contract that we have. Uh, there are um, four schemes. Um, currently in the city, um, which we contract with um, a single care provider to deliver care and support into. And that is a combination of 24-hour um, on-site care um, with additional care for those tenants, which is about 50% of tenants, just over 50% of tenants, who have a formal assessed care need and receive a care package. Um, so we have 201 tenants, um, uh, in the city in, in those four um, schemes. And there are, of course, other private schemes in the city that are private, solely privately funded. Um, we have undertaken a comprehensive review of the service and we can see that there are a number of developments that we would like to make um, for the service uh, there in order to underpin, in the same way really as the home care and supported living discussions we just had, to underpin the long-term uh, viability, sustainability and quality of uh, the service in older people's independent living and to maximise people's independence. Um, we're learning a huge amount um, that cross-fertilises really between the work we're doing in the home care arena and the extra care arena and the supported living um, space. So um, what we would like to request here is that we um, we're granted a 12-month extension on the current contract for the support service at those four schemes um, and that will also enable us to focus on um, the procurement of a new um, care and support service to support the older people's independent living scheme that will open in spring next year at Buchanan Green which is a council build um, and which you know is a really exciting opportunity for delivering and testing out a new model of care. So this extension enables us not only to uh, develop the specification and the service uh, design with people um, in the existing schemes but also enables us to have uh, the capacity and time to develop the specification similarly for Buchanan Green which I hope to be back here shortly. Uh, requesting procurement approval for. So that's really, in essence, um, that's the request is for a 12-month extension. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. And as the ward councillor, where that will be, Buchanan Green, one of them, I'm extremely excited by it. Over to you, Councillor Linda Hammond. Thank you, Joe. We're very brief. Just welcome, Sarah, to this committee. It's good to see you. Um, uh, you know, different people going along to, to, to here because and, and see people that are really you know doing the work here. And I just want to note that um, for the COP objective, that actually um, in extra care over the last couple of years, perhaps um, it's been a little bit of a bumpy picture with um, um, some of the um, providers. So um, I think this is really about setting us 
uh, looking into the long term, but making sure that across the city, that all old people in independent living and extra care, we've got you know really, really um, stable care arrangements, because I know so, so many people value um, these places as a uh, great place to live. I've been to some of these schemes, including uh, White Willows particularly, and you know, it's an amaz amazing place, and we need to make sure that um, we are playing our role in making sure that um, people can live there both in a great place to live, but also with um, the care they deserve. And so I hope this sets us um, on the right track to doing that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ninders Hammond. Uh, open to questions from the executive. No? Okay, any comments? Okay, we'll move straight to the recommendations. Thank you. The recommendations are on page 58. It's recommended that the Cooperative Executive approve the proposed 12 month extension to the current extra care contracts as outlined in this report, approve the issue of 12 month contract extensions to the current care provider for all four extra care schemes. Okay, so do we have a vote on this? Show of hands, no? Yeah, that's fine. Right, thank you very much. That's approved. Thank you very much, Joe and Sarah. Thank you very much. Nice to see you both. <laughs> right, we're going to move on to item 12 which is the reduction to the use of glyphosate pesticide on land managed by Sheffield City Council. We're just going to be waiting for Lisa Firth, who will be presenting the report. Thank you. Welcome, Lisa. In your own time, when you're ready, if you'd like to present, just get yourself sorted. Thank you. Um, so, hi, everyone. Um, I'm here today to present um, a report that's been authored by Ruth Bell, um, who's head of Parks and Countryside. Ruth is on holiday at the moment, and it's a report for Mixed um, Place Portfolio. And um, the report is to, um, to get your endorsement today to, um, to our... our um, submission to reduce, significantly reduce and end the use of the pesticide glyphosate. Um, I'm assuming that you've all read the report, so I won't go through all the details, um, but I'll just highlight some key points that I'd like you to, to, to note today, please. So in the background to the report, um, what you will note is that um, at full council on the 7th of July, uh, there was a petition uh, presented to council to ban the use of glyphosate on council land. Um, and that debate that followed um, um, gained full cross-party support and, so, and some work has been done since then uh, resulting in this report. Uh, glyphosate is licensed in, um, for safe use in the UK until the end of 2022. Um, this may be extended, but we don't know what is going to happen in 2022. So we, 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 what we want to do is the work now, anticipating that it may be extended or it, or it, or it may not be. Um, the use of glyphosate um, to manage weeds and invasive species is, take, um, is currently carried out on sites in parks and countryside, um, on housing land, so housing, um, social housing land, um, on bereavement services land, and also um, on... Uh, on the highway used by our partner, Amy. There have been, prior to the debate at, at full council this year, Parks and Countryside had actually done some small scale trials on alternative uses, uh, sorry, on, on alternatives to glyphosate. Um, and a small scale um, trial established that um, other alternatives were less effective at, at controlling weeds 
and the proposals within this report therefore suggest that we don't actually replace glyphosate with an alternative, but we look at how we can actually manage land without using pest control or weed control. Um, so the proposals and recommendations, sorry, the other thing I wanted you to know um, that, that um, I think Councillor MacDonald noted when, when, we, when we rehearsed this report at, at, at CNT is that there aren't any costs in this report yet. This is an interim report to get your agreement and a direction of travel. So there aren't any costs involved here. There's further work needed to understand, for instance, the implications of stopping to use glyphosate on the highways and with, in, the, in the contract with AMI. That work will be carried out over the coming months and then we will come back to present to you further reports with some more detailed uh, financial implications. That, so there aren't any in this report. What we're asking for your approval today is that parks and countryside can stop using glyphosate in the new season, which the season starts in March or April time. So that will, that will mean that they will cease to use glyphosate from April 2022 and assess the impact of these changes um, and then use that impact assessment to guide our further direction of travel. We want to propose that two cemeteries, Norton and Baton, under undertake glyphosate-free trials for 2022. And the reason that those two cemeteries have been chosen is because they're close to new burials. Um, we want to look at um, carrying out two um, glyphosate-free trials in our housing land, probably in Longley and Gleadless, but this is to be discussed and agreed with yourselves, with local councillors and with members of the public. So this is a proposal to you, this is not the proposal to actually do that on that land. Um, we want a, a glyphosate free trial um, to be carried out on, within the streets ahead contract and we're proposing Brinkliff. Um, again, same, same context, we need to consult on this, we need to seek agreement and we need to talk to local councillors. I need your agreement that communication work can, can now be undertaken across the city, highlighting the importance of these changes, why they're needed and how our, our residents can participate. So we'll be talking about the um, nature emergency, ecological emergency, environment bill, and so on. Um, agree that we can carry out the consultation work um, and with, with residents to share their views because we know that there will be impacts on residents and that those impacts will be different in different areas of the city. And I'm seeking your agreement that we come back to you with further reports to give you the updates from those trials and the outcomes and what the next steps might be. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Um, I think this is uh, really interesting, especially going back, you know, which I didn't, I might have missed it, but, you know, going back to 2019, when we actually began this, you know, so it's kind of, it's good that we're moving it forward, but it's kind of not completely new to the council. Um, did you indicate council to, yeah, that's fine, yeah. Thank you. Thanks very much. And thanks very much, Lisa, for all your hard work on this. And I know that you have put in a lot of hours on it and um, the team as well. So I'm really, really grateful that you've progressed it so quickly. Um, I think it's a fantastic report. I think it's really sensible that we're going forward in a managed way and um, that we're going to do various trials. I think that that really helps us. And of course, it's really important that we communicate with the wider public about why we're doing it. That's really, really uh, an important part of the message as well. And, um, and that, um, that, that the changes in the landscape that are going to happen, that it's not just going to be that we'll have more weeds, it's going to be that we'll actually change what we're growing and what we're planting as well to cope with the change. And I just also uh, want to draw your attention to, if you want to see what a, a garden looks like without glyphosate, you can go to the Botanical Gardens, which I visited recently, and you can see there what, what a difference it makes. And there are no sort of burned edges and soil erosion happening. And so it's actually a really positive thing. And it's already being done, but it's true that it does require... Um, more uh, staff hours potentially so a gradual phased approach is good it's good for the staff to adapt and adjust to the changes and it's really good for the public as well um, and yeah of course very importantly good for biodiversity and uh, ecology um, is why we're what's driving this in the first place so yeah, i hope you'll very much um, accept the recommendations and uh, thanks again for for all your hard work lisa thank you councillor mcdonald Thank you, Chair. Um, 
I'm totally against the use of toxic chemicals anyhow, but um, I'd just like a, a bit of clarification on paragraph 2.7.1. Um, you mentioned gluteless. Is that the area, the, the area that is known to its residents as Gluteless Valley? Oh, okay. So it's Gluteless Valley, not Gluteless. Okay. Yeah, um, I was going to ask you a bit about consultation, actually, and you did refer to it at the end of your presentation, so thank you for that. But just to make sure that local residents uh, and ta the Tenants and Residents Association as well are, are involved in discussion about it, because it is a very distinctive area. It has so much in the way of, 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 of greenery and open spaces and so on that everybody's really proud of. We just want to make sure that everybody understands what's happening and is happy about it. So thank you for the report. I look forward to seeing how it progresses. Thank you. And I will make those changes. My understanding is it is Gleadless Valley, and that's why it's been chosen for the reasons that you've just outlined, but, um, and that we should get, um, I think, significant involvement in that consultation. But we'll, we will be talking to local members about who to involve as well. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Turkin, is it a question? Question still. A uh, short comment, Madam Chair. More a comment. I'll just do questions first. Now I'm getting into the flow of it. <laughs> Being back alive, uh, Councillor Wood. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa, for the report, which I, I do support. And the housing trials, obviously, Gleadis Valley, we're doing a lot of work at the moment with the master plan. There'll be a lot of upheaval on that area. That doesn't mean I would object to doing the trial there, but I do think you, you should include in the trial a stable housing, a stable. We've not got massive development work going on because you could get a, a wrong reading from a trial where we've got extensive development occurring. So I would add an area to that. Where, where we, we're not going to be, be having massive building work going on. Um, and, and if I can just comment, we've, we've not talked to you about this yet. So this is all, you know, things that you will be able to inform. And then if we do agree that that is where we do the trial, then we can take those things into account. But it might be that after we've talked extensively to you that we, that we decide somewhere else might be more appropriate. So that is really helpful. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to say that in the recommendation, there's only two housing estates, so that would have to be, you know, we would have to come back to that as a separate issue. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's all, that's all I'm saying, Councillor Wood, in the recommendations. But I think we take on board your comments and I completely, mm -hmm. you know, agree. Um, I think maybe it needs to go to further to the whole of the Tara movement. Yeah. Because I think once it starts somewhere, they'll all start asking and, and, be, and be questioning. And I think uh, Councillor Wood would really want to be involved in that. Because yeah. the tenants do not hold their words back. I can tell you now, they like to be involved. As can, yeah. Councillor Wood. Thanks, Chair. Um, one of the conversations Councillor Taylor and I have been having is because Parks Department delivers the contract on many of our housing estates. We also need to be able to see what the cost implications on that contract are for, for the HRA and for the council. So going forward, that is a key piece of work we will need to look at. Thanks, Chair. No, you're welcome, because we do have long lake and Gleadless Valley in the you know, those are the two names in it. But I think we've uh, bottomed that. But I'm just going to bring Councillor McDonald in. Um, from what's being said, uh, Chair, um, do we need to amend the recommendations to take out the specific mention of the two areas and just agree to having two, um, the two trials? From what, from what um, uh, Lisa was saying, there's still further discussion to take place on that, but in fact we're being asked to commit to the specifics of it. Um, so I was just trying to tidy up what, what, um, what had been said in, in, in the discussion between uh, Councillor Wood and, and, and Lisa. Um, so because the recommendations are specific, 
and we may need just to delete the, the, the mention of those two particular areas. Bring Lisa back in at this point. Thank you. I think because the recommendations also say that it's all subject to consultation, I think we'd like to start to discuss those areas because they have the, the specific challenges there's a lot you know that you've described i think we'd like to start the conversation about those two areas but if the consultation then leads us down a different path i think we can change that i think because the report says that it's subject to consultation um, i'd like to start the conversation on those councillor wood yeah. isn't there can we get can we yeah. need some legal on that Um, yeah, I mean, it, it currently refers specifically to Longley area and Gleadless area. Um, if you are saying that, I mean, it, it does give you the, the flexibility to be able to change that because it says exact details to be discussed and agreed. However, I would say that that means that the exact details of where within Longley area and Gleadless Valley area, uh, Gleadless area, sorry, you're going to actually pinpoint so so if you do want to move away from those areas it would be safer to delete them okay um, the, the yeah. specific reference yeah we don't want to make it difficult to to move away from those areas if that's what we agree to do so yeah okay so tia wanted to come in yeah just um, just to say the gleadless valley master plan i'm not sure if it would be ready to go next year anyway in terms of building um and so there might be an opportunity to do the trial before work even starts I, i'm not really sure but uh, i just wanted to make that comment that we're not really sure and and also there's a the nature group that's involved in the gleadless valley master plan i think they'll be delighted to have this trial happening uh, in their area um so I think it's still worth discussing it with the uh, Tenants and Residents Association and the other groups involved in the master plan. Thanks. Thank you. I think we're not here to discuss the master plan, but obviously it does build into it. I think what's been thrown out is that I think we need to do work with the Tenants and Residents and with Councillor Wood before we decide which areas we're going to trial. It may turn out that it could be, but I think feeling it you know that that's what i'm getting but anyway is it a question you want to question this time councillor turpin great thank you thank you on on this subject uh, chair uh, so, so gleadless is also my ward as well as councillor mcdonald's and i, I think that, that our constituents would welcome the, the trial there um i do understand what councillor would say about that it may make things uh, difficult if the if, if people if you know, from a public perception but I, I wouldn't want to, I mean, I, I, I would very much welcome the trial there. I, I think that the, the residents would, and, and as uh, Councillor Teal says, you know, we've got a very active wildlife uh, group there. We've got a nature reserve that's is, is one of the, the greenest wards in the city. Um, do you get contact from residents about glyphosate use? Um, would it be possible without then if there's a desire to not tie ourselves to it in case something crops up, could we, rather than remove it, just add the word possibly? Or what, a word like that? Is that would the monitor officer advise on that? Um, you, you can add the word possibly. It just takes away the, the, the certainty then. Oh, that, that's the problem. I think I prefer it either in or out. Um, what, what you could do is is refer to housing land and then have a commitment that you will start by looking at the long and leaderless areas um but but then if you if you take out the bit in the brackets it gives us flexibility to look elsewhere once the, they've been considered lisa did you want to um, i think um what 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 we what we what we're getting into now is actually the, the consultation which is great and it's a debate about whether or not you know the areas that we use so i i mean i would be happy to take them out and have these conversations to agree how we take it forward um and and can i also ask are we are we happy to if we if we do take them out are we happy to keep in the references to um nottingham Baton cemeteries and brinkley or do we want all specifics taken out and subject to that discussion 
I haven't finished our discussion in here yet. So, um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Councillor Wood. <laughs> Obviously, in this meeting, I can't give time scales on the Gleaders Valley Master Plan, but we are pressing ahead with that very vigorously. That there will be action taken very shortly, and we're going to some consultation on that with members. And the, and the only point I was really making is if we was going to be developing a large area when we We've got lobbies and lots of workforce going through that. You're not going to get a real good trial from that. And I'm, I'm not saying we shouldn't do Gleaders Valley. I'm just saying I think one of the trials needs to be in a very stable estate where you're not going to be having that traffic and, and, and mass disruption going on. Thank you. Right, we need a proposal if we're going to... The feeling I get is that we... Um, does somebody want to propose a change to the recommendation? Can I propose that we... we don't use the word possibly, but we use the word p potentially for those two areas, and that gives us room for discussion to come back if, if there was a reason why we couldn't use those. I think it sounds as ambiguous as the other, so I think we've either got to be in or out. I think there's obviously, we're now getting into the consultation, I think what's clear is that we need, there needs to be consultation before we identify the areas. So it's going to happen. We just need some consultation and, yeah. Just, yes, just, just for the sake of clarity, I am not opposed to actually um, this happening in Gladys Valley or Longley, um, but it's just really to tidy up the recommendation. So my suggestion is we've still got the rest of the report, which does make that suggestion, uh, the suggestion about where the starting point is just to take those two out, just, just for the purposes of clarity for the time being. Um, and I have no idea about Norton and Baton. I just did, my only suggestion was about the, um, uh, the, the housing land when, when, when uh, Councillor Wood raised it. But let me be absolutely clear, I am not opposed to it. I'm just suggesting it might be more helpful to take out in the Longley area and Glitters Valley in the recommendations. And the advice we've heard from, uh, from Gillian actually seems to um, uh, support that suggestion. Councillor Teal. Um, actually, I've just noticed there's no date on that particular part of the recommendation. The others say April 2022, but the housing area doesn't have a date. Um, so it's just another thing to consider. Uh, what, I wanted, what I was intending to say, though, was that, um, that if we're having a consultation on which areas to choose, I would like to have a date on that, on when the consultation is going to take place, so that we're clear that it's definitely going ahead, just so it doesn't get kicked into the long grass. Ha <laughs> pun, sorry. <laughs> I don't think it's going to get... We're approving, so, I mean, the thing... It's the fact that you haven't done the consultation before it's come here and, you know, members are actually saying that that's what they would like before we decide where. It's definitely going to happen. So, um, do we need to put a date in that? I mean, it's your report, Councillor Teal. Yeah, the so, so I guess it's what does the consultation entail? Um, how, what process is that going to be? Is it a consultation with all councillors or just with the co-op exec or...? or something wider. It's not clear to me what we're saying about the consultation. Sorry? Deal with it later. I presume, it's not my report, but I would, would have presumed that you would be consulting with tenants, not with the, do you know, I think that's what Councillor Wood's point, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Councillor Wood, that it needed consultation with the executive member and tenants, because that's his area, you know, before it went, do you know, when they helped decide, because that's, yeah. I think, I think there's two sides to the consultation. I think the 
first side of that is to identify the size that the trials could go on in. Obviously, you will want to put two proposed in here, but there may be others, and they should be, I believe, with the local councillors, with Councillor Teal and myself. And we should, when we've got that shortlist, then we should go and consult, in my opinion, with the Tarvers and the local residents. But I think we, I don't think we can look at it to, across the city. I think it t ties up for far too long. But I do think before we commit to Glebers Valley, we need to get some details of the rate of the housing, of the time schedules, of what's been done in what area. And we see how that fits in. Thank you. I think we've come up with a solution. Page 71, it says further details on the trial areas will follow as will full consultation and communication with ward councillors and residents. So if we add that to the recommendations, I think that bottoms all the concerns that have been raised today. Have, do we have a proposal on that to add that? Yeah. I think we've gone round the houses on this a little bit, um, but we've got there just, in the end. I, yeah. I, think we, I think we get the idea of what's going on, don't we? Let's, let's put it to bed. And um, Lisa will look after it from an operational side. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, Councillor. Yeah, can happened? you repeat your... Um, to add to the recommend to us, please. So, Sorry, I'm, I was... No, uh, it's fine, Councillor MacDonald. 2.7.1, the final sentence on page 72... We all found it. It says further details on these trial areas will follow, as will full consultation and communication with ward councillors and residents. So if we omit the two areas, but then add that as well, whatever areas come up, that will follow, and that comes in the recommendations. Okay, Councillor McDonald's, we're taking out Gleadless Valley and Longley, and, and with the ad in, we're adding that final sentence into the recommendations, just to be clear. Is that? Yeah, it, uh, yeah I'm, just, I'm just looking. Sorry, Chair. Yes, and that, that's what, what I'm suggesting that we do. If, if you, at the moment, the way the recommendation's worded, it says exact details to be discussed and agreed, whereas if you actually add the bit that's within the report to the recommendation, it says full consultation and communication with ward councillors and residents. It's a, bit more, it's a bit clearer as to what exactly that means. So it, the suggestion is that um, the, the recommendation would read, agree that two gly glyphosate free trials are undertaken on housing land. Um, let's have a look. The further details on these trial areas will follow as will full consultation and communication with ward councillors and residents. Apologies for being dim, I've just come back from holiday. <laughs> But thank you, I'm happy with that. So we're happy with that to add that. So, right, we'll go back to the recommendations. There's a right long list. I've got to say that word I can't say about eight times now. <laughs> Correct me, Lisa. Tell me how to pronounce it. You still have Glyphosate. Glyphosate. That's <laughs> okay. Lovely, thank you. Okay, so the... The recommendations are we're going to be adding the final sentence as well, which uh, Gillian can read out to me, as well, that the co-op executive agreed to review and reduce the use of glyphosate on land managed by Sheffield City Council in a managed and targeted way, agree that parks and countryside cease using glyphosate in the new season, April 22, and assess the impact of these changes using this work to help guide further changes across the city. 
agreed two cemeteries in Norton and Baton and undertake glyphosate free trials for 2022. Agree that, so this is the bit that we're going to change, isn't it? That we're going to agree that two glyphosate free trials are undertaken on housing land and exact details will be discussed and agreed along with the, no, Oh, sorry, this is, this is the legal bit. I'm not going to apologise for not wanting to, to get this completely right. Gillian, would you like to add that? Uh, I will, yes. Just, just from, from the, the start of that bullet point, agree that two glyphosate-free trials are undertaken on housing land. Further details on these trial areas will follow, as will full consultation and communication with ward councillors and residents. Thank you. Spoken beautifully. Thank you very much. Agree that a glyphosate free trial take place on land managed within the streets ahead contract in Brinkley. Exact details will be discussed and agreed. Agree that communication work be undertaken across the city, highlighting the importance of these changes and why they are needed and how residents can participate. Agree that the consultation work be planned and carried out as the impacts of the changes become known to residents to share their views and agree the further report detailing the outcomes of these trials be brought to a future cooperative executive, executive meeting and for consideration. That was a lot of recommendations. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, are we all agreed? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa. Thank you. Chair? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah. I just wanted to make a short comment on it and to, to thank you, Lisa, and to thank Ruth for uh, producing the report, and also to thank Councillor Teal for her work on it, and also to thank the Cooperative Executive for getting it there and, and you know, um, and improving it, because together we are better. Um, I'm delighted it's going ahead and, it, and that we're seriously addressing the nature emergency, which, as we know, is part of the climate emergency. And just to um, highlight what Lisa was saying, we don't know if it will be banned in the UK next year. It will be banned in the EU. Uh, the Conservative Party have been making noises that they won't ban it, and that's a worry. So I'm really, really pleased that the Sheffield City Council is taking leadership in the absence of leadership from our own government. And, um, and I'm comforted in the knowledge that we're not alone on this journey, and our friends in the EU will be doing it with us too. So thank you to everybody. Thank you, Councillor Turpin. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Okay, we're going to move on to item 13, which is the Revenue and Capital Budget Monitoring 2021 to 22, as of the 30th of June 2021. We're just going to be waiting now for Officer Paul Schofield, is that right? Yeah, to arrive and then we can begin. Welcome, Paul. Nice to see you. All right, I'll hand over whenever you're ready. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm presenting this afternoon the first report to cooperative executives on the authority's financial position as at the 30th of June 2021. Um, I shall be reporting on the position on the revenue budget, the capital budget and the collection fund. There's also a request at Appendix 1 to approve uh, £1.75 million of expenditure to uh, support a information systems project uh, in housing services. In terms of the revenue budget, the position is that we are currently forecasting a £43 million overspend. That's predominantly driven by pressures in social care and £11 million of undelivered budget savings. The detail for members is included in paragraphs 14 to 23. 
a couple of points I'd draw out is that in place, the underspend which we have there is predominantly caused by one-offs where we've carried forward COVID grants from previous years to mitigate pressures that we've got this year. Whereas in people, the pressures are fundamentally in the underlying base budget and will carry forward to future years unless action is taken. Um, paragraph nine makes clear that the current position is unsustainable for the uh, authority. We have started to take a number of actions. Uh, Leaders Budget Review Group approved a number of cost management measures about a fortnight ago, which should help reduce expenditure whilst minimizing the impact on services. In terms of the other appendices that are in the report, um, Appendix 1 requests expenditure to enable us to continue with some urgent work replacing uh, technically obsolete and life expired but critical information systems within housing services. And uh, I understand there is a real threat to the maintenance of services if we don't replace those systems. Appendix 2 talks about the position on the collection fund. Pleased to say to members, there is nothing for concern in terms of implications for 21-22 financial year, but in the longer term, the position on the collection fund will depend on what happens to commercial and retail space uh, in the wake of the pandemic. And that's probably more a national factor than a local one. Uh, finally, Appendix 3 talks about the position on the capital budget there is a relatively small variance of 4.7 million, which is less than 2%. Um, the problems which we had from the disruption from the pandemic last year have now eased in terms of all projects are back on site. But as I'm sure you'll be aware, there are disruptions to the um, material supply chain within the construction industry. And we're also seeing some inflationary cost pressures coming through and we'll be reporting on those in subsequent reports. Uh, so in conclusion, what I'd say is this is a sober assessment of the authority's position, but I think it's one which is realistic, and I think it underlines the challenges which everyone will face in the next few months. Happy to take any further questions, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, for a really sobering report. I'll hand over to Councillor MacDonald. I have a question first, Chair, and then a, a comment, if that's okay with you. Hello, Paul, and thank you very much for the report, sobering though it is. Uh, and I do appreciate all the work that's gone into all of um, the reports that are in front of us. My question is actually about the recent announcement about the solution for um, adult social care that the government has announced. Do you think this is going to have any impact whatsoever in addressing the current issues that we councils are facing in terms of the, 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 the real um, challenges around the cost and demand for social care? Um, I think the majority of the 36 billion that's been promised is to go to the NHS. So immediately there is no direct benefit which we can see um, there could be some indirect benefits which will come to us from changes that will happen uh, in services delivered by the nhs and towards the end of i think it's the three-year period that they um, that the money has been uh, promised for i think there is more available for more general social care than nhs led social care Councillor MacDonald, do you want to? Well, I, I know we've not been working on the assumption that, you know, we're going to get masses of new funding from this government because um, that would be unrealistic. But I just wanted to check with you that this lauded solution to funding for um, adult social care is actually not going to help councils to provide much needed care services in the short term for, um, uh, for, for people who need those services. I think it's fair to say we're still working through the detail of the budget for next year, but I don't think that announcement substantially changes the local authorities' position at the moment. It's not going to... 
it's not the winning lottery ticket we probably need to close the gap. If I can put it that way. Thank you. Um, thank you for that, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Uh, can I just make, go on and make my comments? Is that okay? Or do you want? I was going to wait questions for questions, okay. but I've got you down for a comment. Okay. Yeah. Is that okay? Oh, yeah. Is there any more questions from anybody? Councillor Johnson. Just, just one thing, just about the uh, replacement for housing systems. Um, I, I just want to check: is it um, four, four and a bit million coming out of? Is it just coming out of the housing revenue account? I wasn't sure if there's meant to be some other capital spending on that, or it's just housing revenue. Uh, no, because this uh, is predominantly for the housing services, which is relevant to the housing revenue account. It will all be coming from the. HRA. Uh, there was a provision made in last year's budget that was approved by council um, around some of this put in knowing that the system would require replacing. Um, as further work has been done, the, inevitably the cost has risen, uh, as it always does with information systems. Um, and there will be at, uh, I believe, month five capital approvals a revised proposal coming forward to fund the missing bit of the project. The 1.75 million we're asking for at the moment is um, required to enable the project to complete at speed uh, so that there's no risk to the delivery of housing services. Uh, okay, yeah, sorry, the, so the 1.75, so, so what we're asked to approve is, is 4.38 million looking at uh, paragraph one of appendix one. Um, so the 1.75 is, you said below in paragraph four, but um, this is why I couldn't reconcile it. So it, so it talks about 7.6 million capital and 1.75 1 1 in revenue. Um, and I just couldn't reconcile that with the 4.38 that we're being asked to approve. It, you're saying that it will be the total of about nine million, but actually, we need to approve the four million now, um, and then there'll be something later doing. So I'm trying to reconcile paragraphs no, no. one and paragraph four of appendix one. No, um, sorry, the, the gap that we've got is 4.38, and what we're asking for, to be clear, is 1.75 million now to enable the work to continue at pace to be able to complete it. So apologies for any confusion on that. No, no, thanks. That clarifies it. Yes, that will make sense. And it's obviously work needs to be done because no one can work without the tools, can they? Thank you. Is there any more questions? Comments? I've got Councillor MacDonald wish to make a comment. Obviously, this is a, a very serious position for the council, and this is a really well-run council financially, as we know already. Um, so I want to really reassure the public that the whole council is focused on addressing this challenge, but there are going to be no easy solutions. So some of the things that we're working on at the moment are actually um, covered in paragraph six, starting on page 81. But let us not let the government off the hook. National action is required because this is not just the Sheffield problem. It's a national problem that social care is underfunded and the government is not addressing that. And these latest proposals are not a solution. So I just wanted to make that comment, Chair, and I'm quite sure most of my colleagues would agree with that as well, so thank you. Thank you, Councillor MacDonald, and um, putting my Executive Member for Education and Children's, I just can't, I just have to echo what you've said. You know, we really, central government are just not taking responsibility at all. The rise in demand has been unprecedented um, since the lifting of restrictions, and that's quite evident in the report. And they are, you know, we're doing everything we can. We're challenging back at every, at every turn, and they really have got to start listening. But thank you. Thank you for the report, Paul. And I don't think there'll be one portfolio here that isn't going to be challenged and have to make some very uncomfortable decisions and it's extremely sobering. But uh, thank you for all those for, for delivering such a well-written and very easy to read, even that you understand it. Thank you, Paul, and uh, see you again soon. Thank you. So we we've, we've got to recommend the report first. Here I go again. <laughs>
is that many pages to this report? I want to make sure I get the right one. I think it's okay. page 87. The recommendations are that we note the date of information and management actions provided by this report on the 21-22 revenue budget outturn. Consider for approval the recommendations to pro provide an additional 4.38 million of revenue funding for the place systems review project as detailed in appendix one note the collection fund monitoring report as at the 30th of june 2021 as attached in appendix two and in relation to the capital program note the forecast outturn position described in appendix three okay do i have approval from the cork executive thank you thank you very much thank you paul Item 14 is the capital approvals for month 04, 2021 to 2022, and the presenting officer will be Damien Watkinson. Thank you, Damien. Welcome. Uh, when you're ready, I'll uh, hand over to you. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Damien Watkinson. I'm finance manager uh, for the capital team. Uh, just bringing forward the monthly uh, changes to the uh, capital budget. Um, this month, um, changes to the budget, uh, increasing it by approximately 1.1 million. Um, we're asking approval here for uh, meet those increases and uh, the associated procurement routes that are going along with that, so how we're going to procure some of these items and delegating the authority toward those contracts uh, then to a director of financial and commercial services and also um, to accept two new capital grants uh, that have come forward. Um, I'll not go through every item, but the, the key ones uh, this month are um, £200,000 um, beginning work on the Stocksbridge Towns Fund um, feasibility works on the new community hub that will be there um, that was initially going to be cash flowed from our own resources but we've just heard that government have advanced some of the town's fund money uh, earlier so actually that will now be funded directly through that initially um, there is a new uh, crossing to be developed at halfway uh, to increase safety around the school area and um, we've also working on uh, drainage and paths at Hillsborough Park for approximately 400,000 uh, to uh, enable better use of the park uh, and decrease the damage that occurs from larger events. Um, the two capital grants that are coming through are both from the Brownfield Housing Fund from Sheffield City Region. One is for £350,000 um, to enable us to do some work at Sydney Street, which involves uh, demolishing the building and some re repair works to the um, Pocket Park there in order to uh, release that land for uh, development for, for housing. And um, again, uh, the other grant is for 546,000, um, which is towards a project the council was already in, in, embarked upon, uh, acquiring land at Allen Street in order to uh, assemble a land package that's uh, suitable for developers then, again, to try and accelerate that delivery of housing in, in the city. Um, so, yeah, it's not as quite as many things in that as a, as a usual month. It's been a bit quieter, uh, but they're the key items. So, if there's any questions on those. Thank you. Thank you, Damien. I'll open it up to questions or comments. George. I've got a comment about the Kate Chair. Uh, just to say how, I, as a local resident and user of Hills Park and local council of Hillsborough, how really welcome the investment um, in Hills Park is I know that it can be seen there's a lot around major events but actually that's a very small portion of the park to use that and, and, and small part of the year actually um, the many many tens of thousands of users of Hills Park you know are really really going to benefit from a park that doesn't get boggy over some sections um, much better um, paths and that is 
And actually, it's really wonderful to see the mix of use of Hills Park and things like Cycling for All and the so many runners and different groups and children. And actually, we're all going to really in, enjoy that. And I think it's, you know, it, it, in the difficult times for investment in these at the moment, it is going to make a significant difference. And, and hopefully, it can mean that all the other exciting things happening in Hills Park, like the opening of the um, Coach House with Age UK, it's going to make it an even more enjoyable, wonderful part of Sheffield to, to, to live and, and enjoy. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Linders Hammond. Any more questions, comments? Okay, thank you. So we'll go to approve the report, the recommendation. Uh, so, sorry, Chair, I just wanted to thank uh, Damien and all his colleagues for all the work that goes into to this report and to remind everybody that obviously there's a whole lot of people in, in, in the directorates as well that, that, that are doing the work to put forward these proposals. So thank you. No, thank you. And thank you. Yeah, I echo the Councillor Macdonald's sentiments. It uh, looks quite straightforward, but we know it isn't. <laughs> but thank you. Right, the recommendations are that the corporate executive is re recommended to approve the proposed actions and variations to the capital programme listed in Appendix 1, including the procurement strategies and delegate authority to the Director of Finance and Commercial Services or nominated officer as appropriate to award the necessary contracts and approve the acceptance of grants as a detailed in Appendix 2. So do I have agreement? Thank you. Thank you, that is approved. Thank you very much, Damien. Thank you. Okay, item 15 is the City of Sheffield 1, 3 and 5 Mount Pleasant Compulsory Purchase Order 2021 and we're just going to be waiting for Officer Neil Dunn to arrive. Neil and hello Carl, <laughs> nice to see you. Okay, if you would like to, I'll hand over. Thank you very much Chair, my name is Neil Dunk, I'm a legal and policy officer in private housing standards and the author of this report. Um, good evening, I'm Carl Malouli, um, Head of Service in Neighbourhood Information and Sense Support and I'm here in support of Neil for the report today. Uh, good afternoon Chair and good afternoon everybody. Um, on the understanding that you've uh, all read the report and that the chair will cover the recommendations at the end, I shall just briefly summarise the reasons for the recommendations of this report. Um, this is for a compulsory purchase order for some long-term empty properties, one, three and five Mount Pleasant at Chapel Town. Um, these dwellings have been vacant, vacant since at least 2010 and are in a poor state of repair, attracting antisocial behaviour and having a negative impact on the local community. There is a demand for these types of dwellings within Sheffield and the council has, with limited success, attempted to engage with the property owner in an effort to get the dwellings back into occupation including an offer to purchase them by agreement. In addition, particularly in respect of recent enforcement actions taken by the council, the owner has failed to take reasonable steps to make the dwellings safe. In those circumstances, as an option of last resort, the council considers to ensure the dwellings are put back into occupation, that it is appropriate to seek a compulsory purchase order in respect of the property. Thank you. I'll open that up to any questions. 
Any comments? Councillor Wood. I just like to thank you, Neil and Carl, for all the work that you've done on this and the many meetings we've had, and for trying to explore if we could integrate them into the council's housing stock. But unfortunately, it doesn't fit within the legal powers of, uh, of the man we could bother for the cost of refurbishing these. Uh, I understand why that hasn't happened, but thank you for pursuing that on my behalf and for all the work you not only do on this, but on all the other C CPOs we're talking about. Thank you both very much. Thank you very much, Councillor. Thank you. Thank you. Any more comments? No. Okay, you'll be pleased to know that I'm going to propose that we accept the recommendations on 137, and I'm not going to read them all out, because <laughs> we'd all like to get home before midnight. Um, but thank you. So we, do we approve the recommendations? Thank you. Yeah. And thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you for the report. Just um, okay. I just need to note that the next meeting will of the corporate executive will be on Wednesday, the 20th of October at two o'clock. Thank you for your patience and um, welcome back. And take care, everybody. Have a good evening. Thank you. Well bye done, bye. Chair.